Hello, I am Peter Tush, Curator of Education here at the Dolly Museum. Thank you for joining us for this live streaming of our Coffee with a Curator series. It's been my pleasure to curate this program over the past few years. I'm happy to tell you that my colleague, Dr. Kim McQuarrie, will be taking the helm and hosting and curating future Coffee with a Curator programs. So you will see her introduce next month's talk, which will be me talking about our Diego and Frida show. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors. We want to thank the City of St. Petersburg for their continued sponsorship for this program and for the Dolly Museum in general. We also want to thank Cafe Gala, who will be providing refreshments once this, once this program returns back to having in-person uh, audiences. And we also want to thank, of course, our members who make events like this possible here at the Dolly Museum. Please visit our website, thedolly.org, for more information about online activities and programming. And follow us on social media for more videos and Dolly-inspired conversations. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce um, somebody who has been waiting a long time to have the opportunity to speak here. We have been very anxious. I think we planned this back in March, and everything kind of went awry. So we are finally able to, uh, to have uh, Kelly Figley join us here at the museum. Kelly Figley is the manager of the Tampa International Airport's public art program. And she'll be telling us about how that program works and also some of the things that are happening at the Tampa International Airport to bring back tourism and to make uh, visitors feel safe. She's also going to be joined by Danny Cooper, who is the senior manager of marketing at Tampa International Airport, who will also provide insight for, uh, for us about tourism and the airport at this time. So with that, please welcome Kelly Figley. Good morning. Uh, Danny Cooper and I are really excited to be here this morning with our friends at the Dolly Museum. Uh, we're anxious to talk to you about the airport's public art program and, as Peter mentioned, give you a travel update. You may not know it, but the Dolly Museum and Tampa International Airport have a long time friendship. Uh, we've, over the years, celebrated art and culture together with many partnerships. You may have seen the airport sponsoring an exhibit here at the museum, or you may have seen um, rotating exhibits featuring Dali at the airport. Art takes us on a journey and brings us closer to the world. At Tampa International Airport, we are the facilitators and enablers of millions of experiences every year. Travelers making their way both near and far have entrusted us to serve as the beginning of new endeavors and the culmination of adventures had. More than an origin point or destination, we embrace our role as a bigger part of the whole, the journey. More than 40 years as a commercial airport has allowed Tampa International Airport to build a diverse art collection that reflects our community. The airport continues to rank highly among airports. Tampa was named the best airport in its size category in North America in 2019 by Airports Council International, a leading industry organization. The prestigious Airport Service Quality Award, which is based on passenger surveys throughout the year, is considered the industry's uh, one of the highest in the uh, industry. Also last year, in an article talking about cool ways to de-stress at airports, even though we don't think traveling through Tampa International Airport is stressful, uh, Forbes magazine noted that Tampa International Airport has one of the most ambitious airport public art programs in the US. And in 2018, the readers of Travel and Leisure magazine named Tampa a top domestic airport, noting that cultural and entertainment offerings distinguished several airports, among the most notable, the public art program at Tampa International Airport. The airport has recently issued two, the two largest calls in its history, committing just over $5 million to public art. Phase one, the first call for art was issued in 2015, and then just last summer in 2019, we issued a call for artists for phase two. I'm having a moment uh, adjust advancing slides. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so what I'd like to talk to you about this morning is really get into the nuts and bolts of how the program works. I'll start with an overview of the program, then talk about the public art committee members, the vision for the program, the artist selection process, and then show you the most recent commissions associated with our master plan phase one work 
and give you a sneak peek into what to be looking for in association with phase two master plan work. And then we'll turn things over to Danny Cooper for that travel update. I'll start with a look at the program time, timeline. The main terminal that we're in today opened in 1971. Artwork was included in the building, but it just wasn't called public art at the time. Metal birds by plantation Florida artist Roy Butler hung over the escalator wells to help distract people from the long ride down. At the time, it was the longest escalator in the state. Soon after the building opened, tapestries were added. They helped muffle, muffle sound in baggage claim. Then in 1998, the public art program was formalized. In 2015, the art committee members were appointed for the master plan phase one call for artists. Prior to that, the art committee had not been active since 2008, which is when we added work in phase two of the economy parking garage. In August of 2015, call for artists was issued for commissions associated with phase one of the master plan work. Seven installations were then complete between 2017 and 2018. And I'm proud to report that in 2018, we updated our policy that governs the public art program. Among those updates were a commitment to dedicate up to 2% of the amount of construction costs for public art. And that is for public facing um, projects at the airport. As I've said, Tampa International Airport has a long history of supporting and incorporating art and culture. Prior to COVID-19, we were in full swing with a uh, Friday flight concert series in the new event space in the main terminal, holiday entertainment for the surprise and delight of patrons, and art tours for anyone from uh, kids to special interest groups. And I'm hopeful that we'll uh, get back to those, those uh, events, of course. Hmm. Try, the, um, keyboard. Try the keyboard, okay. There we go. Uh, there are two components of the public art program, rotating exhibit space where we often highlight local artists or galleries and then our permanent collection. Represented in the permanent collection are local, national and international artists. The collection includes artworks dating back to 1939 with a group of George Snow Hill WPA murals at Airside E. You'll also notice from the images throughout the presentation that the airport's collection reflects the abundant natural resources and rich cultural heritage of the re region and celebrates the legacy of Tampa Bay as the birthplace of commercial aviation. Let's talk about our art committee members. I know you're wondering who selects the artwork at the airport. Uh, we have a tremendous public art committee that guides us in our selections. It's not only airport staff uh, making those selections. The secret to the success is, again, the members of the uh, public art committee. We have Tampa Bay area art professionals. We have uh, the city of Tampa public art programs manager. We have a past board member. And we also have aviation authority staff. So we have the executive vice president of marketing who is the chair of the committee. We have the vice president of planning and development. That person is instrumental in helping us incorporate uh, art into the construction process. And we also have our director of maintenance critical to the program because after we purchase and commission the artwork and install it, we have to maintain it. We have a tremendous technical support team. Uh, the procurement department guides the process and selection process for public art. We have support from the legal team, the design studio, the communications team, planning and development. Uh, we have a consultant who helped curate the locations for both phases. And of course, we always bring in the design and build teams uh, to help collaborate on the installations. The vision for the public art program is to craft a unique experience for the millions of travelers every year to provide a variety of opportunities for the traveling public to engage in artistic excellence and to provide cultural awareness for the arts. So if we talk about the selection process, you may wonder how do we select the art? What, is, what are the steps taken? It's a two phase process. In the first phase, the first thing that we do is uh, select a technical evaluation committee 
which conducts a review of all submitted applications and distills the submissions down to a manageable shortlist of qualified artists that they then present to the full art committee. The full art committee then reviews that shortlist and needs to take that recommendation to the board um, for approval before we can move on to the next phase. In phase two, or the next step, involves issuing a stipend to the artist to develop and present to the public art committee a site-specific proposal. The public art committee recommends finalists to the board. Collectively, it takes hundreds of hours to evaluate all resumes and proposals through a fair and open process, which again is facilitated by our procurement department, and then select the qualified artist that best meets the goal of each artwork project. Now we'll just do a review of the artwork that was selected as part of the work done in the master plan phase one. In late 2011, we began updating the master plan. The final plan was approved in 2013, allows the airport to accommodate up to 34 million passengers each year and is divided into three distinct phases, decongestion, enabling, and expansion. It allows a build as demand dictates approach to growth with phases based on passenger volume. The first phase, which was substantially complete in 2018, helps decongest the curbsides, roads, and main terminal. It included building a new rental car center, the SkyConnect train, and main terminal expansion. So you'll see art that was commissioned as part of the master plan phase one work. We'll start in the rental car center with cross currents by Tim Prentice and Dave Colbert. It's a flurry of kinetic elements floating above viewers and responding to the slightest of air currents. These artists are more interested in movement rather than the objects itself. At the other end of the rental car center, we have Palimpsest by Nick Cave. He designed a contemporary tapestry made of beads. The title of this piece refers to something that has been reused but still bears visible traces of its earlier form. Picture, if you will, a graffiti covered wall where each new image builds on top of an earlier work but doesn't totally replace it. The tapestry collects our travel stories. Also in the rental car center is Symbols, Systems, and Proportions by Erwin Reddell. It is a hanging sculpture that consists of three curtains of 81 programmable lights. Each light panel displays a symbol or a pictogram commonly found at the airport, such as an image of a plane, telephone, or an escalator. These images were all adopted from the sign design manual that airports around the world use to communicate with passengers. Each light panel is internally illuminated and the color as well as the brightness is programmed in a slow, soothing light sequence. Reddell is famous for incorporating hang hanging sculptures that shift perception based on where you're moving from. So this, as you go down the escalator to pick up your rental car and shift your perception, um, lends uh, really great, unique views to the artwork. Goodbye My Love Tampa, seven days a week is at Airside F. It expresses the myriad of reasons why people choose to take a plane and the different ways we think about flying. Each of the seven wings of the sculpture represent a, the, a, day of the, a different day of the week. Born, in, born and living in Cuba, Estereo Segura has exhi exhibited in Cuba, the US, Germany, Spain, England, Argentina, Brazil, and Italy. Tendril is also out at um, or is out at Airside F also, and it is by Daniel Canigar of Madrid, Spain. It's an LED screen that coils around the existing truss system out at the airside. The shape of the artwork is reminiscent of vines and features animations of native, non-invasive Florida plants. The videos suggest vigorous reclamation of territory, shifting from fast, invasive gestures to tranquil sequence of species. New animations of plant motifs can be added throughout the years, allowing the artist to treat the artwork like a garden and sort of tend to it by planting new content. The content on the screen is not a looping video. Instead, the computer program generates real-time content using an algorithm. The algorithm is programmed to randomly decide on the life cycle of the plants, speed of growth, how the branches fork, density of the foliage, color, and shape of the leaves, imitating the complexity and randomness of nature itself. 
Out at Airside F, uh, just on the other side of the International Arrivals Hall, we have this beautiful painting titled Verdant Tampa Bay to meet all international arriving passengers. The unfolding composition reveals trees in Lettuce Lake Park, Selby Gardens, Foliage, and the Hillsborough River flanked by bridges, docks, and makeshift houses. The painting uses pores of paint to convey movement and multiple associations that arise with travel. This is by Elizabeth Condon, a former tenured instructor at the University of South Florida. She's based in Tampa and has an office in uh, New York. N plus one is a sculpture that you will find in the terminal at the uh, Sky Connect station. It's a dramatic two-part sculpture. It is suspended above an opening to the third floor at the Sky Connect station in the main terminal and consists of a 10 foot wide primary sculpture of a large opalescent ivory leatherback sea turtle. Suspended above that primary sculpture are hundreds of fine cables holding over 700 small sculptures of turtle hatchlings that collectively coalesce into a particulate 25 feet wide uh, adult turtle, identical in shape and morphology to the sea turtle below. Viewed from below where many passengers see it, the sculpture almost looks as if it's gliding through the air. Uh, this was created by Ralph Helmick. Then, um, now, I'd like to give you a sneak peek into what is planned uh, and been recently commissioned for Phase 2. Phase 2, which broke ground in 2019, includes a curbside expansion and a 35-acre commercial development around the new rental car center. The commercial development area will feature an office building, a convenience store with a gas station, a hotel, and a commercial curb to accommodate transit and other ground transportation connections to regional networks. As we go through these uh, newest and upcoming commissions, keep in mind these nine artists were selected out of a group of 734 responses, which was just a tremendous response. Phase two includes two new express curbsides for passengers traveling without luggage. These people will get dropped off curbside, bypass ticketing, and be able to go directly to their gates. There will be an express curbside on the red side and on the blue side. These will be mirror images of each other. Here you see a rendering of the blue side. And this is just a look at the construction progress. Uh, of course, on the right-hand side, the picture you see the uh, elevator uh, core going in and the photo on the left is uh, the space between the main terminal and the long-term parking garage where the blue curbside will be located. We have two artworks that will be installed on the blue curbside. Catherine Wagner from Oakland, California is creating, she, she will travel to Tampa Bay to observe and photograph native plants. These original photographs will then be laser etched onto green anodized aluminum panels and cut into geometric forms. The etching process will remove the green dye from the aluminum substrate to reveal a photographic image of the plants. The work suggests the dynamic movement of plants in nature and the filtration of light. And this green is quite lush. It's going to be a striking work. The other artwork on the blue curbside will be a mosaic mural by Jason Middlebrook of Hudson, New York. It's a sampling of native flowers, insects, and a snowy egret at sunset. The composition is about scale as oversized flora and fauna are depicted to draw attention to their importance and significance. Viewers will be left with a lasting impression after being presented with 30 foot high flowers tiled in extreme detail. Middlebrook produces the mosaic himself with, with ass assistance uh, in his studio using glass from Mexico and Italy. As I mentioned, the red curbside mirrors what you would see on the blue curbside. We have two art installations going in on the red curbside. The first I'll tell you about is titled Cloud Ascent by Jason Bruges, a London-based artist. It will recreate the experience of ascending through the clouds. An array of opacity changing material sits in front of light emitting surface. The composite liquid crystal material has been specifically developed by Jason in his studio to embody the dynamic cloud formations and weather patterns of the skies above. True to looking out a plane window, the light will change with altitude and the clouds will be displaced by movement of observers on the escalator. 
At the other end of the red curbside is a work by Jania Chape, a Brooklyn-based artist. We uh, expect to get board approval for this artwork in the fall of 2020. It will create, uh, so Jania will create a, a painting that is like the mapping of a landscape. It has the history of lush vegetation that exists in Tampa, but also showing the vision of how it grew over the years. She's a uh, brilliant colorist. It'll be a striking um, painting that will also have channels carved into the aluminum plates. As I mentioned, uh, phase two also includes the construction of, a, of an office building and a hotel. Connecting those two spaces is the atrium. In this render, rendering, you see an atrium space uh, on the right-hand side. A walkway from the rental car center leads into the atrium where, uh, where, where people will be able to either go to the hotel or to the um, office building. And this is a look at the interior of the atrium. Gives you a sense of the space. We have two artworks in the atrium space. This work, titled Cove, is by St. Petersburg artist Jason Hackenworth. It'll be viewed uh, from the third and fourth floor of the atrium. He'll create two colorful translucent kinetic mobiles made of organic forms of varying shape and color. While the inspiration for Cove is a coral reef, the intention is to make forms feel familiar but remain ambiguous and ever-changing. The viewer will feel a sense of oceanic biomimicry. The other artwork for the atrium space is by Sue Sunny Park of uh, Hanover, New Hampshire. She views light as not just a means by which the form is seen, but part of what constitutes the work of art. She sees light as a sculptural material, not because without it you can't see the forms, but because without it there is no projection, reflection, translucency, shadow, so the sculpture is not complete. This sculpture will be composed using a welded stainless steel grid of diacroic acrylic tiles that will effortlessly respond to the movement of its surroundings. The intensity and character of the colors will change as the sun moves over the space throughout the day and will be impacted by the time of day, weather conditions, and the viewing point. Moving back into the main terminal, uh, the third phase of our construction is um, a new air side. That has been pushed, pushed back a little bit, but at the entry zones in the main terminal in front of air side D is planned a work by Claudia Comte, a Swiss artist. The title is Dancing Algae with Starfish Family. In a permanent flow of travelers, the intention is to create and offer a suspended space, a timeless moment to enjoy an aesthetic and sensual experience creating aesthetic contemplation in a space with perpetual movement. The background motif here captures notions of fluidity and continuous flow while standing in contrast to the quiet inertia of the white marble sculptures. Here, perpetual movement and suspended stillness coexist. The starfish are marble sculptures, and in spite of their remarkable weight and apparent immobility, they come alive, float, or fly away on a vibrant graphic background that reveals their organic forms. Passengers are invited to touch the appealing surfaces of the works and even sit on them. We have a new walkway being constructed between the long-term parking garage and the main terminal where we will uh, be featuring Greetings from Tampa Bay by Michigan artist Cheryl Oring. It's a two-phased public artwork. It began with a performance-based socially engaged work in which Tampa Bay residents were invited to share their stories and memories about their cities. In the second phase, hand-typed stories and photographs, both contemporary and historical, were printed on aluminum and formed the material for the sculptures. Oring of Detroit, Michigan put on three performances to capture these opportunities. Going back into the main terminal, the, this is the walkway between the main terminal and the SkyConnect station. This work is titled Paths Rising by Aaron Steffen. Throughout global history, the latter has been conjured as a metaphor for enlightenment, education, labor, and philosophical modes of thought. All of these transitions use the latter to represent an individual's path in the world. 
With paths rising, this dynamic symbol has been adapted to evoke the many individual paths that converge at Tampa International Airport. The work represents a shared moment between travelers, each with an individual journey, gathered together for a fleeting moment as they enter and depart the city. This will be composed of over 300 ladders orchestrated to imply a portal to what lies beyond. Tapered from end to end, they give a sense of exaggerated perspective and seem to meet at a distant point far above. And lastly, for uh, upcoming commissions, how is this for fun? This is by Matthew Mazzotto, a Cambridge, Massachusetts artist. Next spring, you'll see these iconic flamingos in the main terminal in the central area. Flights arrive and depart from the Tampa International Airport, bringing people from their home back to home to a new home or to a place that feels like home. The idea of home or this work in Florida not, is not only for people, it also is home for the abundance of wildlife that lives here. Positioned in such a way as to be popping back into the picture, this floor to ceiling immersive installation gives the impression that the viewer is underwater with water-like light dappling the floor. The ceiling is made of a specialized material that mimics the surface of the water and reflects back the viewer's image. All of the 21 foot sculptural elements, the head, neck and legs and feet are designed to be as lifelike as possible and will be produced by hand sculpting each part at full scale in clay and then casting them in polyester resin and fiberglass composite. The scale of home will be an exciting experience close up as well as seen from many vantage points throughout the terminal. The overall effect is one of wonder, contemplation, reflection, and amusement. And with this, I'd like to turn things over to Danny Cooper, who will give you an airport overview and a travel update and offer some insights into the impacts from COVID. It's hard to follow uh, such, a, such a great presentation about our artwork. It's, it's really interesting for anybody um, coming through the airport when we talk about why we do the things we do. An airport shouldn't just be a transition from one space to another. It should be an experience in and of itself, and our art obviously contributes to that. The airport itself is brilliantly designed, um, but we like to add these other elements into it, these moments of respite that we're able to create for our guests as they come along. We always say guests when we talk about folks at the airport, and we say that because as a heavy, um, what we call origination and destination airport, origination and destination airport, we have a lot of people that come to the airport to pick up travelers as they come and go. On a given day, or what would be a normal day prior to COVID, if we say have 35,000 passengers coming and going, that's 70,000 passengers, on that same day, we'd likely have 30,000 other guests in the airport with us at some point during the course of the day. So airports, this is what they look like. We have runways, we have main terminal. Um, we actually are brilliantly designed, like I said, four air sides, 58 gates. On a normal uh, day, we would be doing 500 uh, daily flight operations. The 3,300 acres may sound big until you realize that Dallas-Fort Worth Airport has 28,000 acres. They also have oil wells, which is a nice revenue source that we don't have to ourselves. We have um, all these other things that you can see here, lots of stuff to maintain with the baggage and conveyor systems, three runways. We also have three general aviation airports. Our enabling legislation makes us responsible for every public aviation facility in Hillsborough County. You can also see here, so it's different than the St. Pete side where both uh, PIE, St. Pete Clearwater International and Albert Witted right next door are what they call municipal airports run respectively by the county and city governments. We are an authority. We are separately established um, as a separate special taxing district of the state. Why is that important? The reason why I always like to make sure we point this out is one, it says exactly what we were created to do. That means we are here to generate commerce and commerce in this area largely is related to tourism. So we are here to make sure people can come and go without people being able to easily come and go through uh, the airports, the commerce of this area stops. The other important part about it, after Kelly just told you about the $5 million or so that we've spent on art that I always like to point out, being a special taxing district, we do have ad valorem tax authority. We could, levy a tax on the citizens of Hillsborough County through their property tax bills. We have not and will not foresee an opportunity where we will do that. We are 100% self-sustaining. 
The only things that we have to be able to do to do anything within our borders is the board has to approve it and we have to be able to afford it. So when we, when we do our projects, we no longer, we, we are not required to go before a city council, before um, a county commission, nor do we have to get voters approval. Five board members and the money in the bank to be able to do it, we get to move forward. So this is a little bit about Tampa's thriving economy. Obviously, uh, things have slowed down a good bit since March, but in real times, in normal times, as we were talking about earlier uh, with the staff here, we are such a vibrant region, 150 net positive moving into the area um, almost uh, every day record-breaking bed tax revenues and all the things we know of that have been happening in this region making it explode both on this side of the bay and the other you also have to realize that the tampa bay region collectively is the 12th largest market in the country we have uh, somewhere around three million citizens in what we would consider our catchment area this one's really interesting uh the airport authority of which Ke uh, kelly and i are employed or by which is only 700 of the employees that work at the airport, but fully around 11,000 folks make a living either at the big airport or at our general aviation airports. Interestingly to note, aviation and aviation related businesses on a local, state, and national level are somewhere around 10 to 11% of the GDP. When Kelly was talking earlier about our passenger forecast and the reason we needed to change our airport that everybody already loved, and they all said when we were starting to move some things, please don't mess up our airport. We understand that we have an obligation to manage and run what is a community treasure. People love what they consider their airport. There is an ownership in this community with Tampa National Airport that you don't typically see. I say all the time when I tell my neighbors or my, my, my son's friends and their parents that I work at the airport, their initial reaction is, I love of our airport. There's a sense of ownership. And then, of course, I typically hear in some way, shape, or form, it's so much better than whatever awful airport they just went through. Uh, so, uh, and I won't name any names. You can probably all guess which ones they are. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we were on track setting records each year um, with our passengers. And we were on track to get to that $34 million, or sorry, 34 million passengers a year by early next decade. Um, we have certainly had to hit the reset button just like everybody else, unfortunately. What's really interesting when we put these timelines up, and this is a, but a snapshot of a much longer uh, timeline and how things unfolded for us at the airport and in the community. It, it seems like this has been going on forever. And in reality, the first case in Hillsborough County happened on March 2nd, just six months ago. So it feels like we've been in this pattern forever. But the good thing when you look at it in that snapshot, that little bit of time is to understand that this is temporary. It is, has been painful for all of us. I know that we were talking earlier, the museum closed for well over 100 days. The airport itself never closed, but we certainly saw impacts like we've never seen before. The only thing that we could even remotely compare it to would be September 11th when there was zero air travel for two days. But we've now been in a sustained pattern much below what we would typically expect. Our lowest day, we had 700 passengers come and go. So that's 1,400 passengers on a day we typically would have seen closer to 90,000. So you see there the 96% reduction. Couldn't have happened at a worse time for us either because spring break has become a big piece of our business. We do somewhere between 40 and 47,000 passengers each way during spring break, which seems odd, I know, because when you think about spring break destinations, this is not your traditional spring break destination, but it is a very heavy family spring break destination. So we get lots and lots of folks coming through during that time. And you can see the three year comparisons there of just how big of a hit it was to our business. In order to reinforce that the airport was ready and that when folks were ready to travel again, it would be safe and clean and as healthy as absolutely possible. We also wanted to make sure that we were able to reassure the economy of the Tampa Bay region that we were here and ready. We branded that uh, five-step uh, program TPA Ready. You've likely seen um, a lot about it. It actually made national news because we were the first airport to come out with a defined plan about how we were going to reopen and how we were going to handle business going forward. You can see the different five uh, ways that we did that. Organizational resilience being a big one. We were very well positioned going into this financially, um, but it certainly has been um, impactful to us. As far as our network goes, 
A little bit difficult to see, I'm sure, but if you can, the white dots are, are city pairs that uh, we lost service to during um, the, the quarantine period and that we still have not yet regained service with. The red dots indicate service that continued happening day in and day out. Part of the CARES Act funding for the airlines was they had to maintain existing city pairs. They did not have to maintain certain frequencies. Um, unfortunately, we are well aware that at the end of uh, September, the CARES Act restrictions do expire for the airlines. So unless there is another round of funding, there is likely to be reductions in service um, across the network and across the US. Tampa is very well positioned to benefit from increased service where other cities may lose. We, of course, had to take a hard look at what we were doing. Kelly was mentioning phase two and the airside D and the different projects that we have programmed to continue growing. I had to take a hard look at what we're doing because a lot of those projects are related to capacity. So if you have a reduced capacity, then suddenly your timeline shifts. As we were setting new records each year, increasing our passengers by a million to two million year over year, airside D became more and more of a necessity and it was always contemplated to be at the end of this decade, and we were starting to think we we're gonna to have to move it up and actually do phase two and phase three at the same time. It now looks like Airside D will shift back into its uh, more originally planned uh, timeframe. Other projects that we have going, some of those have uh, matching funds that came from uh, either the FDOT, the state of Florida, the FAA, or the US Department of Transportation and other various funding sources. If you don't continue those programs, those funds go away. We also have bonds that we've issued and the investors and the purchasers of those bonds expect you to do what you said you were going to do with those monies. So if we had matching funds and we had bond funds that were already available to us and the project was already out of the ground, it made sense to continue it. Projects that we could defer, we did. The interesting thing at the bottom here, Kelly was mentioning the roadways there at the blue curbs. Um, that expanded roadway project is accelerating faster than you could imagine, as well as the roadway work around the main terminal and all the way out to connect us into the, the regional highway system. Because of the reduced traffic, ordinarily we would only be able to do work on some of these projects for five or six hours a day, and we would have to do those overnight. Many of those projects are now working 24 hours uh, a day, seven days a week. You can see here that for a while we were trending above the national trends now with uh, schools back in and what little bit of vacation folks were taking, we're starting to level out with the national trends. Now here's the reasons for optimism. We are ranked number one in the state of Florida for resilience, meaning that we are likely to be the fastest rebounding economy in the state. And that's not just great for us at the airport, that's great for us as a region and that's great for us as a state. The other really nice thing to say over uh, there on the right side is we are the 10th most resilient market in the entire United States. So you might think that there's a lot of folks here that rely on the tourism dollars to make a living, but actually only 13% of the employment here is related directly related to a tourism position. So our economy and our commerce is much greater than what people might think. As we look at surveys and folks that are going, are they going to travel again? People say absolutely, they just not, they're just not sure when. Our partners at Visit St. Pete Clearwater and Visit Tampa Bay are telling us right now that the advanced booking window for their hotels is less than seven days. You typically don't see that for vacationers, but a lot of folks now are just looking and saying, okay, it feels pretty safe. I think we can get there. That fare looks pretty good. And within seven days, they book, they travel, they come and they go. Um, the airline fares are relatively steady these days too. You're not seeing the two week windows of major price increases because they have uh, the capacity to keep their prices low. The great thing about this in terms of 62% uh, are gonna travel for leisure and 33% for leisure and business, that actually mirrors our business mix at the airport as is. We are not a heavily reliant business traveler airport. And because of that, these uh, indicators show us that we should rebound quickly. Really interesting here, as this has been going on, some of our airline partners have seen the strength of the Tampa market or looked ahead and said, we are going to invest some of our additional aircraft back into that market. Of note, Alaska is going to start flying to both Los Angeles and San Francisco. San Francisco, four years ago to Tampa, was the number one unmatched city pair in the nationwide network. We had more people traveling between here and there that could not go nonstop than any other city pair in the country. 
We aggressively sought an airline partner to fly that route, which United did. Within two years, they added a second, a second frequency, and now you see Alaska going in um, to Los Angeles and San Francisco. Why is that great? Because competition almost always lowers fares. So as a consumer, you always want multiple carriers and multiple options going to the same market. Also interesting at the bottom, United Airlines has, uh, for the first time in the history of their airline, decided they will overfly their hubs. They will not fly all of their routes out of Tampa through either Chicago or Houston, and they are going to fly point to point on the four destinations you see below. Also, didn't have time to update the slides since last week, but I think most of you also probably saw the big announcement that all of the legacy carriers have decided that they will no longer charge change fees. So this puts them more in line with the Southwest's and JetBlue's and some of the other uh, carriers um, where, uh, that we see. So lots of interesting things that this is happen that's happening in the industry as a result of this. There is a way out of this, this is temporary. We say all the time, the airport is going to exist long after we're all gone. So six months of pain, 12 months of pain, we would rather not do it. We would rather see and live the vibrant and, and bustling and hustling economy that we typically see. It's weird to be at an empty airport. Uh, but we know as soon as people feel safe again, they will be back because our region and our airport are just too good for them not to. Um, but there are some things that we know have to happen, um, one of which is we would like to see some industry-wide uh, standards. But also, the confusion state to state right now is an issue. Folks don't know if they go to a certain place, if they're going to have to quarantine, or if they come from a different place, will they have to quarantine? Uh, so because this, the patchwork of regulations has made it confusing for travelers. If we didn't have that, I think we'd see a little bit more folks going back and forth. Um, like I said, the bookings are starting to level off. That booking window is much more narrow than we typically see. We're working on the assurances of safety. I think our industry has been ahead of many um, with those assurances and with the practices. Um, but we do expect a full recovery to take somewhere between two to four years, which is why you see three here on the bottom of the screen. And that would be my last slide. I think uh, we, we have time for questions or do we have any questions? No questions. Okay, it has certainly been our pleasure to be here. Kelly is down here in the front row. Um, it is remarkable what this museum has done. We were talking before, I haven't been in the building since 1997, uh, and that was the old building. That's on me. I'm going to come back, I promise. Um, I, I want to just say thank you so much for the opportunity to share our art program, to share a little bit about how and what we do um, at the airport and what it means to, um, to us to be part of this community and how we just can't wait to to get back to supporting the regional economy of Tampa Bay. Uh, we're always here. Look us up at the airport, and uh, we're happy to be there. Thank you so much for having us.